Welcome back to this Digitary Conference, our second day. Yesterday, we had a very dense program from 9 in the morning till 7 p.m. We all got to know about uh, the, our digital project, how we worked, some highlights already, the, the roadmaps, but also uh, insight from other activities, from companies, from public, uh, from about competences, and, uh, and also the poster sessions. Uh, this was a great day. This morning, we just come from a guided tour in, in the Hofburg. In the, uh, we saw, we visited these uh, rooms for, for the, our presidency. And now we are back. And now we come more or less to Styria. And this morning, this is Styria session. And we have highly recognized managers and uh, CEOs and uh, from, the, uh, from the government, uh, from uh, companies, from municipality here, and they will talk to us. It is the first session, and then we have lunch break, and then afterwards we talk about the impact. And now we also, Studio is uh, very well represented, and we, you get to know really what we have done concrete in the territories. And now I give over to Brigitte Christ. She, is, she, she will lead the session and she will present also the speakers. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Sorry that I have paper here. So it's not that I not trust in digitalization. I, since yesterday, I do not trust in energy supply of my device. So <laughs> sometimes you're restricted to, to find other solutions. Um, Mariana is doing the time management and they like to, to tell the speakers if she moves ahead, what is it, the yellow one and the orangish one? So it's like the same in COVID. So she says orange, then you have three more minutes to react. No, it's the yellow one. Okay, so if you, do not, if you do not stop at the orange one, I get in trouble. <laughs> okay, so as Marianne said, we, we turn back to Styria and we invited, as you already said, managers from companies, from SMEs, from global companies, from global SMEs, and all of them were very engaged in our roadmap. Uh, uh, I think all of them were members of the Student Stakeholder Advisory Board, and um, all of them were engaged in the implementation of actions. So they brought a lot of spirit, a lot of ideas, a lot of engagement to our roadmap, and it's a really a pleasure for me to have them here today. We start with uh, Iris Fieldsvisa. Iris, you can already please come up to me. And there's, um, you can, can you get familiar with this one? <laughs> okay, I, um, you know, I, I got some information from her, but I tried to grasp more from the web, so there's a little bit more. And it was said about Iris when she was a child, they found out that she uh, has some technical orientation, or how can I say, I don't know what you did. <laughs> Maybe she, I don't know, re repaired the car of her father, I don't know. Uh, and then when she did her, her basic technical education, she decided to do the next stuff thing in Austria. She decided to come to Leoben, to Montana Universität, and studying metallurgy. Woo. I don't know, you were you alone in your, in your semester? No, we two. were two, and we were only two students, so we had 100% female in our Great, semester. great. I've never, <laughs> I've never experienced this, but this, but okay. And then she said, this is a nice story. She said, in 2005, I decided to, to found with my husband the company MedTop because this was the easiest way to bring up my three children and make my own decisions. A very, very brave decision, I would say. Uh, some information for you first. MedTop is a global acting metallurgy company for copper, basically. And in the last years, you turned step by step in the field of recycling. So this is very, very, very important topic nowadays to get more in circular economy. 
And uh, since 2020, she became the president of the Austrian Cooperative Research Organization. And now she is head over, I don't know, four of how many centers these are in, in ACR, how many institutes? 19. 19. So she's really top of Austrian research. So, and then is something, there was an interview, and I like to tell it because this is very important for gender equality. Uh, sorry. Um, and she said, it's, it, all, it was always very important for you to, to balance the family life, the children, and the career. And this is why she attracts females to her company to give them the chance to, to have the same situation. And I think you have how many, how many female employees? Half. 50%. 50%. So, Iris, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello. So, I hope Brigitte will also introduce Michael on the same way, how many childs he has and how he did, because I hate it. <laughs> I did a technology study. I'm a technic. I'm a manager. Okay, I have a private life, but that's nobody telling about the man. That's the truth. So, please, whenever you introduce someone, I have many publications. I'm manager of two companies. I'm Austrian Cooperative Research President, and I have a private life. So, that's important for me. <laughs> Sorry, Brigitte. <laughs> so, nevertheless, while I'm here today, I should tell you something about digitalization. Uh, maybe you're not aware of it. I'm, a, I'm between university and research done by SMEs. So I'm very deeply involved in kinds of that because I'm the president of the Austrian Cooperative Research. Maybe if you don't know it, this is an institute of research institutes all over the field. So we have wood research, we have plastic research, we have social research. So if you have a look on it, it's really an unbelievably great uh, group in Austria. We did a big study. I can use this, I think, the green button. And that's why, I mentioned this today, that's why because we did a big study in Austria about how SMEs are doing in digitalization. And I want to present this and maybe finally I will give you some comments based on my experience. So if you look at SMEs, they are always in competition. SMEs in Austria are, I would say, the basic of the entire economical field. So in Austria, SMEs are very important. And there is, um, I would say, from the people side, it's more than 90%. From the turnover side, the industry is much bigger. But you know, it's always a big adv uh, advantage to have good SMEs, then you have good industry. If you have good industry, you have good SMEs. That's something works together, it's no doubt. When we did this study, we were asking the SMEs how they see digitalization, what they think they use for digitalization, what's the problem in digitalization. So I, I'm sorry about it's not only Styria, it's that the, this study was done in entire Austria, but it doesn't matter in my opinion. We are so small, it looks everywhere the same. So what are the trends? What are the this is, these are all answers based on the Austrian SMEs. What do they think are the trends? They think the trends is uh, they need data to be able to make decisions. I think that's a clear point and it sounds very easy, but I'm coming from the metallurgical side and I can tell you if you go in a plant, I'm in the copper industry, you're in the steel industry, but in the copper industry and you think it's a well-educated industry and you go in and say, give me the data, I will make you a thermodynamical process model because very easy, off gas, slack, commerce, chemistry, heat, temperature, then you will find quiet. They have millions of data, but they cannot use it and they are not doing something with it. Of course, steel industry is a little bit more tough, they are a little bit far of us, but in our industry, for example, they really do nothing with these data because they are not available. If you go in SMEs and ask them for data, in many, I'm talking about small SMEs, they don't have any data because they are not really used in digitalization. But all of them are aware of it, they will need it. So what we did, we were asking them, how do you use, for example, information? How do SMEs use information? And of course, everybody is asking internet access. If you're a manager of a company, do you think this would be the first answer? My peop I'm happy that my people are using the internet access. So you can see where the problem starts. 
if you're talking with normal people, with people on the floor, with normal people in the SME about digitalization, the first idea they have is communication, the first idea they have is internet access, and the next thing is how they can use the social media channel. Nobody really immediately bring it together with all the advantages which digitalization will bring with us. You can see here online sales. If you look at our study, where is online sales? It's nearly at the end of the bottom. Or online ordering, it's also at the very end of this study. For me, this was really critical to see this. If you ask people in the SMEs how they see it, this is the answer. So, why is the reason? We ask them, what's the reason for you to increase your digitalization program or to put it in your company? And what you can see here, it was also, for me, critically in principle, the answers. The answer is to be in the trend. Every one of you who is related to uh, economical decisions in companies or is responsible for the turnover in companies, do you think a manager will say, we should be in the trend? Yes, nobody will do this. You should be prepared for the future. You should be optimize your company. But the reason for increasing di digitalization, the, the, many of them is saying we want to be in the trend. Stand out from the competition. It's also, it's, it's not really a, um, a target for the future. It's more or less a conclusion. So in my opinion, what we can see here is that SMEs really cannot see their advantage and they really are a little bit far away. It's too abstract for them in my personal opinion or in my experience I have. Very interesting was the last point, increase in cost efficiency. Everybody has this bubble somehow and think, if I do digitalization, okay, we have internet access, okay, but cost efficiency will come. And I want to point it out, this is a big discrepancy because how these two points came together, nobody is really, for, for the people it is not clear how they can do it on that way. What we also were asking, what are the big barriers for doing the digitalization? And in Austria, this is for Austria mainly, the lack of employees was the biggest barrier for them. The lack of employees, especially in SMEs, you can imagine, you, you have a huge group of people which are focused on, your, on, their, uh, on their field, but they are not so open for other fields. That's also a little bit the Austrian mentality. So we, 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 we like to be specialists, but we don't like to be very open for everything. So this was the biggest point, and the second point was the high cost for the project. So this is also, uh, I was surprised of it because I thought the, the costs will not be the, the limit for doing digitalization. What you can see here, what, what, what are the greatest challenges? And the greatest challenges are data protection, and everyone who is discussing digitalization should think of data protection. And if you go to SMEs, that's really a big problem for them. Especially in my area, in the last year, we had many attacks and we had huge costs involved in the attacks. When I look at the Murmürzfurche, where many of these people here are coming from, we had three big SMEs had been attacked and it was really expensive. So I had to come to the uh, end and I'm quite around. What are the challenges for SMEs? And the main challenges are factors internally. So it's not so, the problem is not coming from outside, but for SMEs, they really have problems internally to be able to do digitalization. And if we have to look in the future how we can solve this, in my opinion, this will be really a big problem. Because in what I see also in the education side, um, I think I will let out this. I only want a last sentence. In my opinion is when we think on education, our education system learns us studying methodology, studying economy, studying chemistry, being in medicine. You need digitalization, you need digitalization, you need digitalization, and you need digitalization. But in our education, 
You can study digitalization, of course. But in my opinion, this is the biggest mistake we are doing in the moment. We should bring in digitalization in the education, in every field, everywhere, and to everyone, and not only doing digitalization as a main job in the business. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> One comment from my side. Um, first of all, I found all information on the web. <laughs> this is one point, and the other thing. The other thing is, in our in our roadmap, we we saw that we're all individuals, and we only want to live with persons in the region, and we want to have the best conditions for our family, for our kids, so that's why I said it. So you're a really tough person, <laughs> but I have some data from the men as well, <laughs> if it was on the web. Okay, the next one is Mike Wurm from Bruckmoor, from the company Mehr IT, so Mehr means more, and he's, how to say, more, IT-minded, because there was no information on his family in the web. <laughs> but, yeah, of course, you are experienced in that. Uh, and I can tell you why. He did two IT studies at the University of Applied Science uh, at your FI Neum. And he's not only, he was not only studying there, he's a lecturer there since many years. Um, and uh, he has experience in e-commerce, in technology transfer, so this is your core topic, bringing knowledge to the others. And um, yeah, there are a lot of other competences, so in software development, in web application, in mobile app application. And as I already said, he's a lecturer, so I see at the moment nothing about his private life. And he founded Mea IT in the year 2012, is that yes. right? Yes, and, now, and you are still the CEO for it. And um, since 2020, he was uh, elected by the Austrian Federal Economy Chamber as regional officer for this field. And he is an UPIT specialist group as well. So, Thank you. go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, hello and welcome uh, to my presentation. Uh, about challenges of digitalization and Epic thank for, um, for the last presentation because of many data about uh, SMEs and I will go into this um, information because I have um, collected some challenges and I will call it challenges, no problem, because uh, we have to handle those challenges in the future. Yeah. Uh, my presentation is about uh, to create a definition of F SMEs in Austria uh, because it's really important to understand uh, how many SMEs are in Austria located. Um, the second part is about the common challenges. Um, I collected uh, six different challenges for, um, for smaller and medium enterprises. And the last part uh, will be, if you had uh, enough time, uh, some opportunities in digitalization. But first of all, who am, who am I? Um, you have heard some uh, information about me. I'm a managing director of my company, and I'm also a senior lecturer for many years at the University of Applied Science. Um, for me, it's really important to uh, help other companies um, uh, at their challenges. So I was um, elected by the uh, Austrian companies to represent their uh, needs in the regional office in Brooklyn and Moor, and also at the specialist group for the um, accounting, um, consulting, and IT companies. Yeah, now um, I have a little game for you. Uh, you have guessed the number. So how many entrepreneurs employ uh, zero to nine um, people in Austria? What do you think? It's the first, the second, or the, the third part? Maybe raise your hand if you think it's lower than 200,000 um, entrepreneurs. Okay, just one, two. Uh, who thinks it's the second uh, option? Okay, more than two people, yes. And uh, the last option about more than 500,000? Okay. That's the correct answer. We have about uh, 5,404 the uh, thousand um, entrepreneurs in Austria, which is a huge number, um, because we have to think about how many peoples or what is the total number 
um, in relation to uh, the complete work um, enforcement in Austria. What do you think? It's more than uh, or lower than 50 percent? Do you think it's between 50 or 90 percent? Okay, some of it. More than 90 percent? Yeah. That's also correct. We have a really huge number of people who are working in such companies. So it's really important to understand uh, which is the field of small and medium enterprises. It's really the, the biggest part in Austria. So we, we have to think about the needs of digitalization of those companies. And these needs of digitalization or the challenges are other challenges than in the big industry. So we have to think about the, um, the industry regions where the small and medium enterprises are located. So, but we will switch to what I'm talking about now. Um, I'm talking about the experience with and of SMEs in Austria, in special of Styrian SMEs or Upper Styrian SMEs. Um, in my opinion, it's also really important to understand uh, that I'm talking about SMEs with 5 to 50 um, employees because um, they are the biggest challenges and some of the medium enterprises um, have the same challenges, but they have the um, possibility to handle these challenges easier than the smaller enterprises. So, and it's the last part. Uh, it's also really to, uh, good to understand uh, that I'm talking about the SMEs in traditional industry regions. Uh, we've heard before the Moor Mürzfuche. Um, it's about the Upper Styria because it's a long tradition that we have uh, really huge enterprises uh, um, industry about steel and how to work with steel. So the common situation about SMEs and digitalization is uh, that the requirements of digitalization is not clear at all because um, there are some special technologies, some special knowledge needed um, in the field of e-commerce, in the field of uh, processes and so many other fields in, in such companies. Um, you also have to handle with missing awareness sometimes because the longer tradition companies with so, so family companies have um, yeah, father and mother in there and uh, they, they don't know anything about digitization. They uh, have the children, yeah, here has the computer and please help me with this computer, but uh, the older generation uh, have no awareness about this new field. Some of them are strongly against digitalization and we are in a really uh, big challenge and in, in a time of change in those companies. So the missing or wrong information about you know, or knowledge about the benefits, uh, we have to transfer this information about benefits to the companies. And also sometimes employees are against digitalization because they have a fear of loss uh, that they uh, will lose their workplace uh, in such companies if uh, digitalization will um, get a part of it. So I um, decided to group uh, such challenges into the six fields, uh, acceptance, investment, strategy, employees, responsibility, and being up to date. Uh, if you remember the last presentation, uh, we uh, saw that some of them uh, were also the opinion of, the, um, of complete Austria SMEs. So we can go deeper uh, to understand that acceptance um, will be handled um, by two possibilities, top-down versus bottom-up. So if the lead of a um, small and medium enterprise is not um, aware uh, for using such strategy in their uh, company, it's not possible to, to use a digitalization process. Also, the investment is a really big a really big challenge. Sometimes it's a problem for the smaller enterprises because digitalization costs time and money uh, to, to handle a, a really good digitalization process. But it's, it's um, sometimes I'm not understanding this field because uh, if you're both uh, bought, uh, or if, you, if you will buy a machine, it's always an asset for the company. Uh, but there are no awareness that, for example, a digital service could be also a really important asset for the company. So uh, the cost for digitalization should be also investment for the company, but many of the leads don't understand this fact. 
So other challenges, for example, the strategy and uh, the employees. So digital know-how is often lacking in companies. So we have to uh, handle those uh, fields of care uh, to, to build up, uh, for example, courses or better education systems uh, for younger people. So we come to the other field about the employees. Uh, sometimes they don't understand that uh, digitalization would be good for them uh, to, to handle their work with more efficiency and not uh, that the digitalization will destroy their jobs. Oh, I have three more minutes. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I have time enough. Three more minutes. Yeah, no. Uh, three, three minutes left. Okay. Uh, no time for jokes, so we come to the responsibility and being up to date. Um, first of all, the responsibility is um, a really important part because s s some people or some, some leads of uh, companies think that, uh, hey, this is a technical guy, he will do the digitalization. And the technical the guy is the secretary, for example. That's, n that's not uh, um, a good opinion. Uh, so somebody of the company has to be responsible for the digitalization process. This person has to be, um, has, has a special knowledge. Um, and if they don't have this knowledge, uh, you have to bring up the knowledge to the company for, for example, with external know-how. Um, so dig digitalization and digital contents must be maintained in the company. And if you think about your own company, how many data is not up to date? How many inf information uh, have a lack of um, yeah, many years, for example? Think about some websites. That's, that's almost a really good uh, example because uh, go to the news section of any website and you see news about uh, 2010. That's not really uh, the best practice. So up to, up to date implies uh, that the company needs time to, to handle those uh, data and to be up to date in such any field in, in, uh, within the company. So at the end, I will come to the opportunities um, for smaller uh, businesses. Uh, for example, uh, internal op uh, process, uh, processes has to be optimized that could be handled for, uh, with internal or external uh, know-how. Um, also, uh, the workflow could be become faster and simpler. Uh, that's really important for growing, uh, for um, company growing, because uh, smaller um, companies has no time or has no possibility to invest so much costs in their uh, um, employees. So they have to become um, faster or become smarter in their processes, and many other uh, opportunities could be a, a possible impact of digitalization. Yeah. So thank you for your attention. And at the end, we have some time for any questions, I think. <laughs> okay, now we, we turn a bit. No, I'm not turning away. Uh, we turn a bit away from the SMEs. We come more to the large companies. And I'm, I'm really happy that Michael uh, Eder is now with us. Yes. <laughs> we met personally for the first day. OK. I have to, OK. Now I have to explain. In the program, we have um, Franz Rotter. This is not Franz Rotter, but Franz Rotter. <laughs> uh, he, he apologizes. He, he got sick. and. Uh, but he said the, the best person he can do. <laughs> okay, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Eder. So there I have no private information I have to tell. <laughs> but he's also very engaged, as you will hear. After, at the end, I tell you something about me, so that's a fair story. Um, Michael Eder is the Global Chief Digital Officer of First Alpine High Performance Metal Division. So this is really a huge company. And now it gets really even better. He is the managing director of the newly founded First Alpine Performance Metal Digital Solutions GmbH. And there is an information about his career, information about his career. He started as an automation engineer in the iron steel industry. And um, 
yeah, then there is something like a white area here now. <laughs> and then it's told before he, he turns to First Alpine, uh, he was working in a consulting company. So that's the next information, and now some information about his study, which is really impressive. Um, he, has, he holds a degree as engineer in telecommunication engineering, as well as a master degree in business science from Johannes Kepler University. And he was uh, supervised by Professor Matzler, Matzler in his PhD. And I tell you, if you do not know Professor Matzler, this guy is really great. He is an innovation professor in Austria. And if you come across with him, talk to him. And uh, yes, this was all about his, his, his private life, what we get for him. And please go ahead, tell us about your company, about your job and your digitalization strategy. Hello, everybody. Um, so I have a private life, actually. <laughs> so I, I, have, I have two kids, and I brought them to the kindergarten and school today, so in the, in the very morning, and I have to pick them up afterwards as well. So, um, so thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me as well. I have to cover for my boss, for our boss, for Mr. Rotter. Obviously, I'm not Mr. Rotter, as I already said. So he wanted to really be here together with you and present his presentation that I have to hold now for him. So also please bear with me if I don't know all the details in there. I should know at least because I'm responsible for digitalization, but I try something I've never done before. I'm holding a presentation I have not compiled. Yeah? <laughs> um, so having said this, I hope you bear with me for the next 10 minutes and I can give you a little bit of an overview on our digital journey that we um, um, embarked on a couple of years ago. So who is First Alpine? For those who don't know it, it's a, uh, one of the biggest companies in Austria and uh, a technology and steel company um, based in Austria, headquartered in Austria, but also operating worldwide. And uh, uh, the connection to Styria is that a large proportion of uh, the business in Austria is also done in Styria. So in total, First Alpine is a, a company with 50,000 people, 500 companies, uh, and a, a turnover of 15 billion uh, euros uh, worldwide. Uh, and in Styria, we have, uh, and I have to read this now, about, about uh, 4.5 billion turnover with uh, about 9,000 people operating in, in 13 uh, companies. So that's a, a big impact for, for Styria as such. Uh, and uh, we have four divisions in First Alpine, and for one division, I'm responsible for digitalization. And from this division, I can present you now, um, so to say, the, 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 the knowledge that we gathered with regards uh, for a big company uh, as compared to the smaller companies that we heard, which was also quite interesting, by the way. Uh, high Performance Metals Division is a worldwide operating division specialized in tool steel, special steels, and so on. Um, and especially in, in Sturia, we have uh, our, our, one of our biggest, uh, comp or several biggest of our biggest companies. It's uh, Böhler Edelstahl, Böhler Aerospace, and uh, Böhler Bleche. But there's also a connection to Wermland, where we have also a company. Who knows this company that we might have? Okay, very good. Who is it? <laughs> very good. Ude Holm is also a part of our, of, our, uh, of our group. And so we are very proud to have also this connection over there. Yeah. From, from, yeah, I know that. Uh, that's, I know it. I was part of the Digitary project. So <laughs> that's why I mentioned it, actually. <laughs> okay. Good. So um, having said all of that, uh, how do we click to the next one here? Green button, good. Um, uh, Mr. Roth is not only just a smart guy, he's also uh, very famous on doing uh, uh, quite complicated slides, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he, he can transport it very well. Yeah, I try my best. So, <laughs> um, so the, the first one, and I have just a couple of those, uh, don't worry. Uh, so it, it, it illustrates a little bit the status of our digital transformation. And really when we started, when I was hired as well in 2016, we, we started this journey on the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah? And we, we, what, we, what we experienced for ourselves is it's, it's the wrong term because it, it's simply not just production and industrial revolution. It, it really leads above that. Yeah? And we changed it uh, very quickly to digitalization. Uh, one of the first things. So my position was also one of the first positions as a CDO in Austria. So this was, and then the movement came, um, and um, and we progressed. What you can see here on this slide is we progressed over the over the journey from 2016, 17, 18, where there was a lot of focus on smart production topics. You can see that somewhere here on the middle right part here. 
Um, but we had also other topics already defined, like smart logistics, uh, products and services, uh, support processes, and so on. And we also defined for ourselves what is digitalization, what do we want to achieve with it. We, we set the targets uh, for for this journey that uh, um, you know should contribute to the to the business targets as such. And we evolved over the last couple of years. You see, we changed also course of direction, directions sometimes, and uh, it's not not a surprise. But in the in the last uh, two years, there's also uh, more and more focus on resource efficiency topics, sustainability topics that are affected by the digital transformation. And you can see that there was a, a, a quite a progression over the years. <clears throat> so uh, when we see this, why did we change the course? Why did we adapt? Of course, first of all, we learned a lot over the, over the course of the journey, definitely. But there are also a lot of risk factors that for, especially for big companies, internationally uh, working companies are there. And, um, yeah, it is, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it is uh, that there is the acceleration of, uh, uh, of the metamorphosis of the globalization that we experience, uh, everybody, nowadays. Then there is the energy supply topic, uh, in, especially in Europe, <laughs> that we are painfully uh, uh, pay the bill right now. Uh, we have uh, the reduction of the raw material resilience. So uh, where do we get it from in the future, especially when we think about the new technologies, uh, which is a topic. and. Uh, we have also a disruption of the European value creation efficiencies, meaning uh, the productivity gains that we from year to year see are going, getting less and less. So in Europe, we have about 1% uh, per year, which is really neglectable. In America, it's a little bit better. In China, it's about 4%. Of course, they come coming from a different base. But what I want to say is this is not enough in order to be competitive in the future. And these are the things that we need to care about as well. And of course, we have heard it already, the disruption on the, on the digital, uh, for, uh, via digitalization and the opportunities of technology that we get. And what you see here on this slide is basically the impact uh, um, of, uh, of these changes on the business logics um, of, a, of a multinational company, especially with focus on Europe. Uh, and when we started in 2016, it was already visible, but not, you know, Digital transformation was the big topic, but step by step, other things were coming in. As you see here in 2020, it was also the, the globalization topics. We had barrier, trade barrier restrictions in America and, and, and worldwide and so on. So these are the things that, that also um, uh, you know, uh, had an, a big influence on our business models. Um, and uh, when you go further, we had a second phase where we see this uh, globalization is, is, is decreasing and where there was also, of course, everybody knows there was the COVID crisis that was coming in, leading to even stronger impacts um, on the business models that we see. And last not least, of course, the, the war made it totally clear that also the, the energy topics uh, and, and furthermore, the, the, the globalization that is reducing step by step is, is affecting us. And the essence out of this is that um, for, for us as a high performance metals division or as, as, as first alpine as such that these business logics that you see that we have in in our companies uh, that we have to really change that going forward and to think about new solutions that we bring in and we define that digitalization is one of the core drivers to uh, uh, to achieve that yeah so how do we do that um you see a lot of parts, and this is maybe not the full picture, but uh, we have uh, a lot of focus on smart factories. I have, if I have time in the end, also uh, one, uh, one slide at least uh, from the new production plant that we are currently building in, in, in Kapfenberg, in Styria. So uh, smart fa building smart factories, getting more educated, using data, getting towards a data-driven organization. This is what we are continuously working on. Um, there is also uh, connectivity that we're building between our evaluated service sites so that we understand where which material is stored, how can we um, serve the customer best, um, which is from, from coming from silos to more integrated, more connected uh, supply chain. We are also working on smart products and services. Seems a little bit, you know, uh, um, Russian was it in English? Uh, surprising, um, um, because there's a steel block. Yeah, how smart could it be? But we are working on really products where we integrate sensors, where we um, have uh, coatings and surfaces that are smart and can transport information and these kind of things. So stay tuned for innovations coming up in the next years. And there is a big additive, uh, metal additive manufacturing network that we built over the last couple of years that we already have in in actually almost so in America and Asia and Europe as well, 
um, where we are building these competences and it's a major contributor to our normal business in terms of uh, additional offerings and, and value-added creation that we can uh, so, uh, um, provide for our customers. <clears throat> On the other side, you see newer topics, uh, especially with regards to sustainability. So we clearly believe that digitalization is a core enabler for sustainability topics when we think about, uh, for instance, uh, CO2 uh, tracking or uh, circular economy topics. So these are the things that need digital enablers or digital appliances, technologies and tools because otherwise it's, it's simply not possible. And we have the scrap management, we have logistic topics uh, and also customer management topics that we have. And all this together leads to a lot of kind of topics and levers that we can improve. I don't go through this now in detail, but uh, the, the most important thing for us is we want to get uh, to, towards a learning and agile organization. And this is our core aim, and a lot of things are contributing to that. Um, what uh, is also very important are we need other competences. We have already heard this today. So. Um, how do we do and how do we do this? So we are a core believer that we cannot build everything in-house. You need to have a good ecosystem that's more the right-hand side that we build. Um, there are just a few examples like the digital material value studio uh, and so on and, and, and uh, ecosystems that we build. But also in-house, we are trying to improve the understanding, the knowledge of people because we truly believe that the process managers of today um, are the digitalization leaders of tomorrow. So we are building these competences in-house as well. We have a competence center, as you see, you have some pictures here on the left. Uh, we have a digital academy that is creating digital ambassadors and data science and AI experts. Uh, we are implementing S4HANA, everybody uh, I think does <laughs> with the SAP focus. Uh, and we have uh, founded also the digital solutions uh, uh, and spin it off as an own company that I'm uh, happy to lead. And, and this is so this should give you a little bit of an um, overview. I mean, we're working on much more topics, but um, uh, on what we are doing and which abilities we have. If we compare it to, to SMEs, so there, there's a lot more opportunities that we can do as, as, as I experienced today. And um, that makes me really also happy that we have these opportunities in a way. Um, yeah. Last, last one. Um, Short overview, we are currently commissioning the uh, high-tech special steel plant in Kapfenberg. So this, uh, the constru construction period was uh, since 2018 to 2022. Um, it's really a replacement of the old steel plant that, that we have there since uh, a, a long time. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, it is really fully digitized uh, production processes. We have um, a, a lot of process data points that we are gathering and optimizing. We have machine learning models and so on and so forth that we have in there, uh, fully automated uh, melting processes and so on. Uh, and also the qualification uh, of employees that we're doing um, in our academies in order to be able to run these kind of things, because you can imagine this is really uh, um, something different. It's, it's not really manual process anymore. Thank you very much for your for the opportunity to speak here, for your attention, and questions afterwards. I think, right? Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Great job. Because I, I think you you were were on on a, on a business trip till yesterday. So, yeah. okay. So, micro. Okay. Now I'm coming to Michael Schikofer, completely different background. He was politician. And I can tell you, you find the information about his children on web. <laughs> he has got three, so that's all what I will tell. Michael, please come up. Uh, yeah, I'm happy that you're here, of course. And uh, Michael, he did a lot of studies and one in politics science, of course, in business administration and I think in law, this was the last one. And uh, he has a lot of positions in different organizations, public organizations or private organizations for more than years. And he has his own consulting company, as I remember. And his core topics are uh, development and innovation and future-oriented concepts for regions as well. So that's why he's here. And uh, the link to the politics is you have been in politics how many years? 20. 20 years. And he was seven years. He was in the government state of Styria. 
uh, and he was in charge of finance, so this is always the tough start stop, and regional development and disaster protection. And as, as I remember, you started with the digital strategy of Sturia. This yes. was under your, under your period. And I'm really happy that you're here, and please go ahead with your presentation. Now he's working for the SFG. Sorry, that's what I've missed. Thanks a lot. Uh, warmly welcome here in Vienna, especially to our colleagues and friends from Farmland and Grand Est. I hope you enjoy Vienna, and I hope I will see you soon in Styria, because it's a great country to live, also to visit, and it's a very innovative country. So that you get some feeling of Styria, I would like to start with a short film and then present you our country. So nice to meet you and please come to the green heart of Austria and to Styria, which is the European's cutting edge region for technology and innovation. It's important to know some facts about Styria. We have a population about 1.2 million people, but we are very proud of 65,000 students in Styria and we have nine universities and that's a uh, really a high number of universities in such a small country in comparison to Grand Est. We have just one million people, you have five million people, but we are very proud of 65,000 students in Styria. And we are also proud of the city of design of Graz, our capital, the second biggest city in Austria. And what's really important to know that doesn't work. The green one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Two green ones. <laughs> the green heart of Styria. Oh, there is Styria. Okay. You see all this information here. What's important to know is that we are the region within Europe with one of the highest R&D rates with more and over than 5%. That's very important to know because it's the basis for our strategies in Styria. It's the basis of the development of Styria. We are a traditional industrial region, 
but we are now really in this transition process and we have very modern companies as just mentioned the first really strong companies working together with our small and medium enterprises. 55% of Austrian researchers at technical universities work in Styria, so that's important to have the basis of know-how here in Styria. It's the basis of our success also. And seven of 10 Austrian companies with the highest R&D ratio are located in Styria. As mentioned, uh, the small and medium companies are the backbone of the economy in Austria and especially in Styria. But we are very proud also of these big companies who really are leaders in Styria for innovation also, like NXP, RMS, Siemens, Infineon, Anton Bar, AFL, EPCOS, or the first. And we have with Uranium Research one of Austrian's largest R&D institutions. A further very important strategy in Styria is the cluster strategy. So we want our big companies to work together with the small and medium-sized companies to work together with our universities to discuss the plans with the politics. And so we implemented six clusters for green technology, the green tech cluster, for human technology, for wood and wood solutions. We are now dealing with wood as a material, how we can use it, for example, in the car industry. So not just building houses, but also find new applications uh, and use cases for wood. We have the creative industry cluster, the Arts Asturia, and together with our neighbor country, Carinthia, uh, the Silicon Alps cluster. So that's very important. It's also very important to know in the process of the transition and the digitalization because our companies work together in these clusters and facing together new challenges and uh, thinking about new solutions for Austria and for the world as a whole. Uh, we are very orientated on export. You see a uh, lot of companies. What's important is that our economic minister sees that uh, the digitalization process is important for the companies, but also for the people. It's our target that we take all students with us on the path of digitalization. That's also the reason why we implemented the broadband strategy. Uh, we have to discuss a lot of topics, but we need uh, the technical basis, and that was the thing I implemented together with our economic, economics minister. We want the fiber to the home in Styria for more than 90% of the people. We want that the small and medium companies have access to really fast internet. So it's an enormous and uh, important basis. And we think that broadband is also a big chance for the regions because this and while decentralized work and lifestyle is possible. We also discussed that within the digitary process, and that's important. That's the great chance. I mean, we are talking a lot about risks, but it's a great chance offered by the digitalization, especially for our regions, and we should tell that to the people. We did one important step further, and I want to say thank to the digitary team and the partners all over Europe, 12 partners as a whole, because with the research and responsible research and innovation approach, we really brought together people from universities, ordinary people, people uh, from schools, students, companies, the communities, and they discussed together how we can face the future. And that was important because we uh, discussed a lot of technical things with our partners, with the mayors, with the politicians. But uh, yesterday we talked about culture, culture in the companies, culture in the regions. And uh, uh, I think uh, we have to discuss all this technical stuff. It's very important to talk about data. 
but it's also important to talk about culture and thank you to uh, the Digitary team. I think this discussion about culture was really important. It brought us forward and I think we are all facing difficult crisis right now and history shows we can deal with this crisis and gain the changes better in working together. So thanks a lot and last time, please come to Austria and please come to Styria, the green heart of Austria. <laughs> <laughs> difficult for me. Uh, I like to thank all for their speeches and now you have a, a, ra a rather good overview on that and I, we do it as yesterday. I ask them some questions. You have one minute to answer, not more, because we're a bit uh, uh, behind the time schedule and then you have the option to ask. So today they are here for free. You can ask them. So take the opportunity. Okay. Uh, Iris, you, you have the experience as, as international manager, as, a, as an SME, and you show, have shown us what, what, what is the challenge of innovation. May I ask you to, to highlight the three most important points, <laughs> the most important points for an SME. Can, can, you, can, you, can you tell us from, what is the most important digitalization SME going on the global market? I would say the most important point is being aware that you have to go on the global market. That's for <laughs> me the most important thing for SMEs. They are not really aware of it. Second point, in my opinion, motivate your people to see the strategy, to see the future. And then uh, I think you need all the, the tools to be able to do the digitalization. Okay. That's all. Very easy. Very okay. Yeah. <laughs> Marianne, can you write it down in the minutes, please? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike, you are working with local small SMEs, which may be more oriented to the Sturian market. What is your recommendation to them? Or how can you help them? What, what are the main barriers you want to overcome with them? Um, I think that, that uh, digital education is really important for um, old people, not only for young people. Um, they should be aware for di uh, digital digitalization. Um, and I think there are more opportunities than uh, problems to be uh, within the process of digitalization. So now we have problems or what is the challenge? I think the biggest challenge um, <laughs> is the awareness for uh, dig digitalization because um, if they are aware uh, for this topic, uh, they want to, to handle this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to uh, in introduce solutions, digital solutions for their companies, um, and they want to handle it by their own. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question to you. Maybe it's difficult, I don't know. But I think this is, the strategy you've shown seems to be rather unique, or isn't it, for the steel industry? What is your guess, your experience? And then I have another one, because you said we have to compare with other market areas like China, and you said Europe has only 1% growth. So what can we learn from the others? Is, is there something, or, or we are ahead in digitalization? Okay, answering the I first. Know, very difficult. <laughs> so in one minute, two questions, okay. <coughs> yeah, I try my best. So, so I think that from a strategic point of view, I think it's quite unique. So uh, I always say we are the pharmacy uh, of, of the steel industry, so to say. So our average uh, sales volume is 70 kilograms. And this on a worldwide basis, this is really small. So what our strategy is, is really to forward integrate and to offer more and more value added services on a local basis. That's why have, we have so many outlets worldwide. I think this makes us quite unique, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and when it comes to digitalization, I think, uh, what was the second question? Uh, on, on the 1%, on the, growth, percent, growth. On the growth, uh, um, you, you should ask the politician, the, <laughs> the former politician actually, <laughs> and not me, <laughs> what, we, what we can do. Can so I can, I can just tell you what we do. So we, we are fully aware of that and we want to raise that uh, definitely. And, and digitalization is one of the core drivers. And I think uh, what I wanted to show you, at least I tried this too, that we have a holistic approach. And what I did not mention is it's not just a technology transformation. Uh, it's first and foremost also a cultural and mindset transformation. And so uh, the slide I normally present is that you have a, a technological transformation times, not plus, times, so multiplier, 
a, a cultural transformation because if one thing is zero, then the outcome is zero. And I think this is what people have to have in mind and this is our approach that contributes also to have more efficiency gains as in some areas at least uh, as compared to others maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> now it gets really hard. Um, Michael, uh, uh, the SFG is very active in the ecosystem as a whole. You have we've shown the clusters, but can you tell us something how you as SFG support the, the queue from education to research to other competence center? Can you say something about that? Because you are a, you are and, and the government of Stuart is very active in, in building up competence centers. Can you say something about that? This, because this was a bit missing for me. <laughs> yeah, as mentioned, we have competence centers, about, I think, 30 competence centers for digitalization within Styria. Very important are our clusters who support uh, each company. And my colleagues are here. We have also the regional innovation coaching. Uh, so colleagues who go out to the companies and discuss with them the digitalization process, their innovation processes, so that they get all the necessary support from Styria, but also supplies from Austria and other agency. And it's important to bring together the small and medium companies with the big companies, with the universities, with the communities. And that's our job to organize it. And uh, for me, it was very helpful to have Digitary because you organized it for us. And it was a, a good possibility for us to discuss with a lot of companies. But I mean, to be honest, we still have a lot of work to do because as you mentioned, also in politics, we discuss a lot about the internet access, but not about uh, digitalization as a whole. And uh, so this knowledge transfer uh, between also the regions is very, very important. It's essential for the future because we need the common vision, but now we need action and we still have to do a lot. I mean, you know, I'm very proud of Styria. We have a great research and development rate, but also in Styria, we have a lot to do. Uh, in the digitalization process, but we are proud of such SMEs and big companies working together with the gov uh, govern uh, government. And so, as in a lot of fields of politics and the future, it's important to work together. And I think that's a good process. Thanks a lot uh, again to the team from Digitary. Thank you. I like to mention they sometimes give funding. <laughs> okay. Very quickly, my, my last question to all of you from your perspective, we have different perspective. You were in our uh, digitary roadmap, you were engaged in the development in the workshops. We tried to do implementation in the, in the last year actually. But what is your recommendation for the next four years? How should the, the region go ahead with implementation? I start, Iris, with you. <laughs> I think that's a really, really awful question. <laughs> yes, I'm That's a naughty the boy. <laughs> I'm a naughty uh, girl. <laughs> the truth is, in principle, I have no idea how they should do it. That's the truth. Because when I see my surrounding, I can recognize that we are challenging with many, many other problems. Digitalization is not on our menu at the moment. And I think this will be the biggest problem in the next five years. We are talking here digitalization, but if we have an energy crisis, if we have... Uh, I, I told them yesterday, I heard all the investors are going away from the center of Europe. If we don't have money in the countries, then we will have a other challenges. So mm -hmm. I think we should do the focus on, is we should combine it. I think the SMEs has had three years, which were very hard in Austria, Corona, many SMEs mm -hmm. uh, could somehow survive corona and now the energy crisis is coming okay. and we are completely different structured as a big company mm -hmm. there is a family structure there is not that huge money behind it there the thinking is completely different bringing an international investor in a sme is critical so mm -hmm. i think we should be open to all of our problems and if we can put in digitalization to help us to solve the problems we are training now, mm -hmm. then maybe we can do it. But okay. I am a little bit scared of it that this will be okay. really the focus for the next two, three years. Okay. So it will need another process of regional co-creation and then come on, let's work on it, not only discussion. <laughs> um, 
that's not an awful question. It's a really big question, I think. <laughs> a big awful no question. <laughs> um, uh, I have the same feeling like last week in my company, in my office. Um, when my employees come to me and say, yeah, we have so much uh, to do and we have those, this project and that project and so on. And I think I can give you the same answer. Uh, we have to do it step by step. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a, a long journey and we have to start at, at one point and we have to think about which is the next step and we go through each step. Mm -hmm. That's the best solution, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ada. You have the view on both roadmaps. <laughs> I like the question. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, this was not a question, so <laughs> but you not know what initial. I'm asking. <laughs> um, it's the same question you yeah, asked, right? Right. Okay. Of um, yeah. So, uh, what can I say? So, I think the, the 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 simple message is do something. Please do something. So, uh, we have also roadmaps. As long as they're on paper, they're worth nothing. Yeah. So we have to really act upon it. And I think if I can pick one of the, of the elements out of it, uh, please focus on uh, education. Uh, and not just, edu as you said, not just education on the university, but it has to start with our children. Yeah? So when I look at the, at the Volksschule, uh, what is it, primary school, where my, my daughter is now, there is, I mean, they are trying to do something, but it really can be much, much more. And we have to start there and then from, or even in kindergarten. And then from there, build this kind of capabilities that we need in the future because we are falling behind. Yeah? Other countries and continents are doing this. We don't, and or not to, to that extent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is, this is one thing um, yeah, that I would, I, I would love to see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course, because now, now the last one is Michael, the last important. one is Michael. <laughs> if you look in Austria, they, the government brought in the children in, this, in the, between 10 and 15 years old, they have two classes where they get laptops. But to get an idea about, my daughter is in some of these classes, they got the laptop to make a digital education and one time a year they are allowed to take it to school. So, I only want to add this, the, how we are doing it, so there is a huge thing to do. We, we take care for technology. Uh, Michael, you have, you have heard the words, what they were saying. So what are we going to do? <laughs> action is always the most important thing because discussion is a good thing, but you have to act and you have to do something. And what, what I want to mention finally is that digitalization is a very important tool to face the crisis in the world and especially for example the climate crisis. I was also, also responsible for our energy company in Styria and when we want to reduce uh, uh, the gas for example, you have to have data, you have to use this data, we have to have smart meters for example in the household so that we can optimize this. So it's a very very important tool and uh, as you mentioned we should tell the companies and we have to have a discussion about it. How can we use this tool to face the coming crisis, the actual crisis, but uh, dealing with the energy crisis, data and digitalization is very important. And if we want to use the new systems, the solar panels and so on, we need uh, the, the right technical uh, combination. And so, it's important, it's a tool, it's a good tool, we should use it and uh, yeah, well, action is always the best. <laughs> Soul fit, not only action. <laughs> okay, we have, Marianne, we have some minutes or the time is over because we started later. Okay, okay. I think there are some questions now. I start with Sean Schack, then Andreas and then Morten. More than a question, a, a comment, we are very pleased uh, to announce you that the University of Lorraine joined the European University Eureka Pro, mm -hmm. in which the Montan University at Leoben uh, play a very active role. Yeah. So that's uh, it's a link between uh, Grand Est and and Styria, and I think that's uh, my colleague from University of Lorraine, Vincent Boli, uh, Professor Vincent Boli, that we are very happy that the links uh, will be strengthened between our, mm -hmm. our two uh, our two regions. And, and maybe a question that um, we, we are facing the same problem in contest uh, digitalizations. It's not the only problem that we are facing 
a big energetic crisis. And uh, at the moment, in fact, the SMEs are in front of two challenges that to solve the question of digitalizations and and the, and the greenizations of the of the business. And I think that we will succeed only if we could combine both. It's, it's clear, and, and that's why at regional level that we set up a recovery plan for the crisis in order to provide assistance to company to do both at the same uh, at the same moment. But my question is that what is the most uh, important challenges for SMEs in your in your region is to find the competencies, to find the money, to uh, to find the right partners to succeed in digitalizations. That's what 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 is the main uh, the, the, the the main challenge for you? All of them. My quick answer is to find employees. We have in, in our region in Styria we cannot find employees. Very easy answer. You call it talents in France. You call it talents. <laughs> okay, Andreas, professor. No? <laughs> uh, th th thank you. I think it's very, very great. Uh, and I would like to make a comment to Iris and to Michael. So for SMEs, what you have told was very interesting that 95 or 99 said internet. And why is that? Because internet is a commodity. Internet is a commodity, everybody get access to it. Talk about broadband, maybe it's just about the speed. But to get internet requires very low effort and no key talent. Why is that? Because we had 50 years of research and development to make internet to the current state. Now, if we should use data and do data-driven decision, this is intrinsically hard because of two reasons. Why? Because it requires many, many skilled experts and data-driven decision-making is not a commodity. It requires 20 years plus of research and development to make data-driven decision-making in an automated MLOps way integrated into machines to make this a commodity. And if this is not solved for SMEs, I mean for Udeholm or West Alpine, I know Rene wants to hire five data engineers. SME cannot hire five data engineers. So they rely on external parties to commoditize data-driven decisions. And you need to make this available after this job is done to be maintained, to be updated, and so on in an Amazon or in a Tesla way to cope with the drift in the data, to cope with the quality of data, and so on. So this is very important that we make this barrier for data enabling data-driven decision-making on scale in an agile way for SMEs as low as possible. Thank you for that point. Morten, very quickly, because Marianne gets a bit nervous. <laughs> May I react quickly on, the, on this question? So we, we can also not find these five data engineers, by the way, because they are not available for us as well. So it's also a problem on, on talent that we are lacking. Yeah. From, from everywhere, from a startup to a scale-up to a bank to a whatever it is. Yeah? So it's not really bound to our industry anymore. And this is where we are competing with everybody in the market, actually, on this talent that is so short. Yeah? Sorry, Morten? Uh, Morten Nguyen. I'm uh, a member of the External Experts uh, Advisory Board in Digitary. I have a question uh, for uh, Michael Ulm. Uh, I'm afraid I, I lost you a bit in the beginning when you mentioned definition of SMEs. Uh, what I wonder, do you ha operate with a, a, a separate definition of SMEs in Austria to the EU definition? Or is it the same definition? Um, we have the definition in Austria about SMEs that are from, from zero to 205 people. It's the same, it's it's the same, same euro, it's the same definition, yeah. Okay. I think we have to, is there, a okay, she's telling me I have to close. One, 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 one quick, one quick, so sorry mm -hmm. uh, to, to spoil this now, but um, I think we gathered a lot of knowledge. So what I heard, from especially from SMEs and looking at the three of all of you, so we could offer to, to also, you know, share this knowledge. I think this is the sharing economy that we need to get into. So when I th talked about digital uh, academy and all these kind of things, this is this sh this shouldn't be just only there for first opinion. We can also kind of share this knowledge that we have there. So I don't know to whom to talk to afterwards, but let us let us really think about other ways on how we can do the education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. I must okay. add it. That's the only way we can do it, in my opinion, and it's a question <laughs> of the age. 
it's a question to be open, how open you are, and in, uh, for Austria and also on the politician side, in my opinion, that's the most important thing, share your knowledge. Okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you for... You, okay. <laughs> now, I can't stop them, Styrians. No, I can't stop. <laughs> I'm not French, but I, I need this time. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, about the definition of SMEs. It was really um, important to understand that in Austria it's, it's the backbone of Austria, that we have a really huge number of SMEs. This was the reason why I've pointed that out. Um, or the industry is important, the SMEs are important, to work together is important, uh, but we have to know uh, about these facts. Okay, so now I think we have to come to an end. Um, first of all, I think we made everything right because you said that what we had, we ha no, my micro. Okay, we have everything on our vision. So we are open, share knowledge, create knowledge, and then act. So this is the principle for the future, I would say. And there's still one question open about my personal view. If you go to the Google machine, enter my name, scroll down, then you know about my passion. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. All to you. Thank you so much. This was so an interesting session and we got an idea which competences uh, here in Syria. Thank you so much. Uh, I th before we go to lunch, we have one more presentation and this is Anders. Uh, he, we switch a little bit to, uh, to smart specialization and uh, I think we have an, in Sweden, they are, we can learn a lot from them. Uh, smart, in in Karlstad, there is the Smart Specialization Academy. And uh, the OECD has assessed the Smart Speciali uh, speci Specialization Academies in the world, all of them. And Karlstad is the best Smart Specialization Academy in the world. And therefore, I have to, uh, because we, we talk here about regional development and smart specialization, and therefore, it is a great pleasure that Anders can uh, present uh, and can talk to us about the Smart Specialization Academy. And he is also uh, in the county of Vermland, and yeah, it's, it's very good to have him here. Welcome. Yes, th thank you so much for in inviting me. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you have to, to put some restrictions to that statement from the OECD. It's in a small region with one university and very developed cluster uh, cooperation. And then I think it's uh, something behind that statement that we are kind of a uh, global best practice, among others. Uh, um, and, I, and I'm very happy to tell a little bit about the story behind this. So, first, uh, we have for, uh, um, formed now the second smart specialization strategy. It was uh, adopted and approved by our politicians on the 8th of March, which was very... Uh, good uh, timing because we are also focusing very much on gender in, in, uh, integration in smart specialization. That's quite one of our strongest areas and that's because it's needed. It's really needed. Uh, see if I manage to change the slides there. There it goes. So just a short, a brief presentation of our present strategy so you get an idea what it is about. The vision is a sustainable Värmland that makes a global difference. This might sound as a very bold statement, but I think, and I'm quite sure that with our innovations that are very often or, or almost always in a sustainable direction, sometimes also changing the world market and changing the world, the way of how we do things. For instance, recycling cotton. We have, there we have a, a, a technology that, that is scaling up. 
And our smart specializations, they are the forest-based bioeconomy. I think that's our strongest area. We also have a big uh, manufacturing industry and, and steel industry with Udeholm, first Alpine, as you heard today, as, as the, I would say, the, the leader in, in that smart specialization. We also work with the sustainable solutions connected with photovoltaics, where we have a strong test bed and strong research groups at the university, at Costa University. We also have digital health innovation, which is more of a softer, so to speak, area, uh, which also is, is very strong and is improving in, in a very high pace. And Ingrid Ivars from Compare is one of them in that team working with that specialization. We also have attraction through sustainable place development, which is a little bit odd when it comes to smart specialization, but we also have some innovation in that area in the, uh, when it comes to digitalization of the experience of, of places. Uh, food in sustainable interactions, uh, mainly we, the food area connects to the, to the forest-based bioeconomy because it's there we have the test beds, we have the knowledge about the process industry, about packaging, etc. And last, uh, and uh, not least, but yet, uh, yet quite small, there's the computer games and gamification, and that uh, lies on the foundation of that we happen to have, I think, the biggest gaming company in Europe, Embracer. That's our unicorn in our region that we are very proud of. And they are closely involved in the development of this strategy now as well. Uh, and we have also realize that we have a number of assets. If you gather these three uh, smart specialization on the left hand, we have uh, uh, significant uh, resources to work with the develop development of the smarter energy system. And there's a research group that Andreas Kassler, for instance, uh, lead. They can also work with uh, machine learning how to optimize the uh, electric grid. And the other side of the smart specializations, they, they have joined forces within areas as sustainable, healthy, and equal smart societies. This is our first stepping and trembling steps for working with the mission-oriented approach, which the European Commission nowadays are, are uh, uh, rolling out especially connected to the Interreg Europe program. And we try to find ways to contribute and be a little bit a part of these missions. And we also have a number of perspectives that we uh, try to integrate into the smart specializations. And, and the way we work is that we have platforms for one on each of the smart specializations and also for the perspectives. So we have organizations driving uh, more or less open innovation processes uh, connected to these areas. And they have, they have the, responsibility, the responsibility and also the mandate to be a leader of these processes. Uh, so, for instance, the, the forest-based bioeconomy, uh, the, the, the holder of the, the open platform is the paper province and digital health innovation, and we, there we have Compare, for instance. But also, the, you see this digitalization perspective go, that should go to, through all smart specializations. That is also, uh, there we have uh, put the responsibility also on, on COMPARE to drive this, together with the region Värmland ourselves as well. Uh, now to Costa University. It, it's quite easy for us because we have one university, so we can have a very close cooperation with with Costa University. And for us, from Region Värmland, from our side, it's important that Costa University is internationally strong with excellent research and with a strong sense of the place. That's the, that's the, the thing to have both those perspectives in mind if you want to cooperate with the university. Otherwise, it, it doesn't fit them. So you have to have a good understanding of the culture and the driving forces for university. And we have formed a common brand, the Academy for Smart Specialization, 
where we gather all projects, research and innovation projects across the university under this hat. And we have a management uh, capacity together to uh, coordinate the, this research and do monitoring it, etc. And also to, to promote it and make it well known. And what happens over the years, this is not a, a new in invention. We have worked with this kind of cooperation, I think, uh, soon uh, 20 years. Uh, but what happens that uh, there is always uh, or continuously new research groups that decide to join the Academy for Smart Specialization. So this is a growing community among the researchers at Caster University, the Academy for Smart Specialization. And we are building trust which is needed. You, you can't order researchers to do things, but you can attract them. So the, this is the um, front page of the evaluation that Marianne uh, mentioned. Uh, we had a, a, uh, an evaluation group in January 2020, just before the, the COVID uh, uh, bro bro broke out and got the uh, final report in June the same year. So some co codes here from, from the, this study that they could see a high acceptance and implementation levels of smart specialization in Värmland and uh, the commitment to the implementation and subsequent performance of the strategy is evident across a large range of regional innovation actors, including the regional authorities, which I represent, uh, Costa University and the cluster organizations in Värmland. And the strategy carries a high substantive uh, importance to the regional innovation stakeholders, confirming its transformative potential. I think this, the, uh, the late letter here is very important that it's a, it has a transformative potential for the regional economy. But it, it doesn't ha happen over, over one night, but I think we are on that, on that uh, track. Yeah, yeah, I can skip this. So, uh, a little bit of history. Why c could we come to this position? This is the front page of our first smart specialization strategy. It was formed during 2014 and approved 2015. And the statement we did there is that specializations are both about what we are good at which is which all, all regions do, but also what we are good for. And I think that's the point, that it, it should also bring values for sustainable development, for digitalization, the green transition, etc. cetera. Uh, and it, it's uh, happened, we not, it does not only happen to be two women on the front page, it's also, we, I think we were the first region in Europe to make a full gender integration of a smart specialization strategy. So all sentences, all, all actions were scrutinized in, in that respect. The, at that time, we had five smart specializations, five clusters, cost the university center role, the newly started cost innovation park, a science park, uh, was a part of it. We have uh, the, the Brussels representation, we also at that time got to, uh, have uh, started uh, an accelerator in the forest based bioeconomy, the Sting Bioeconomy, which now are scouting uh, startups from Sweden, the Nordic countries, including uh, the Baltic countries, but uh, in practice, the whole globe. We have, we have startup companies now from, from England from, and from Canada, etc., within this accelerator. We have test beds in, in the region. Uh, etc. So smart specialization in Värmland that is more than business research competitiveness, competitiveness and growth. It's also about contribute to mitigating climate change, uh, support fossil free products, the circular economy, personal health, uh, gender equality, uh, the experience industry and culture. It's about digitalization in teaching and learning. Innovation in public sector, in the health sector, for instance, and also now, uh, now even more emphasized social in innovation so we can also get the bottom-up approach and, and uh, involve civil society and, and the inhabitants in, in our region in the broader sense in smart specialization. 
Marianne, please say when it's, I have to wrap up and, and this, yeah. Uh, these are some examples from 2020, and now we have even more startup companies from the forest-based bioeconomy. And then you should know that uh, in 2014, 15, we had literally no startup companies within the forest-based bioeconomy. The approach was that we have a strong industry, very conservative, very expensive processes. You can't fiddle with, that, with them. Uh, that was the, uh, the, the general co conception. But when we started this process, uh, starting up this Sting Bioeconomy, Sting stands, for, uh, by the way, for Stockholm Innovation and Growth, and why Värmland, we are 300 kilometers from Stockholm. That's because in Stockholm Innovation and the Growth, they realized they don't have the ecosystem in Stockholm for industrial uh, acceleration. But we have, in Värmland, we, we have it. And we have proved now for seven years it works. Startup companies find it attractive to come to Värmland, and we can help them with a number of assets and knowledge assets to, to, to make them accelerate in a process industry. And we have an, a good number of, of them. You have, for instance, wood tube. They are making uh, uh, construction equipment for, uh, for walls indoors on, on paper. And they are building a factory now. Uh, we have Lixia. There are some, some uh, women that have made research at uh, Imperial College in London for a new method to uh, make cellulose-based raw materials of other stocks, feedstocks than wood uh, available for cellulose and lignin production, for instance. Uh, and I think that's a good example of, of making a, a global difference that, that could if they succeed, we, they, we can, can, can get access to more, very much bigger feedstocks for, for cellulose and lignin than we can do uh, in, in these days. Bright Day Graphene, they have their origin in Stockholm as well, as KTH. If they succeed with their, their innovation, they can, can potentially produce graphene, this super material, in bulk scale with very high quality with the uh, with the uh, vegetable with the forest based and other raw materials today you have to knock on on the graphene uh, samples to, to produce small uh, volumes of, of graphene yeah there are a number of, of very exciting startup companies uh, that have a very big potential and this uh, uh, specialization, digitalization of welfare services, uh, there we managed to get a national funding for 10 years with the, uh, uh, with the uh, where they sh or we should develop an internationally competitive innovation system within this area. And, and actually, we were, we were competing with Stockholm in that competition to, to be a Vinvex winner. But I heard from beside that our group, they talked as one group. In Stockholm, they came and, and made one presentation per actor and had no interaction within each other. So we, we are small. We can integrate ourselves more than the big cities and be faster also. We have proved it in that way. Yeah, uh, Ingrid showed this slide yesterday as well. And I think that's a very good sign of how this area has evolved from 2019 actually to, to I think 2021 where, where Digital Well and Compare have grown their, their network in an amazing way. And uh, for instance, when you have investors forums, you have not uh, one or two or, or 10 investors, you have two or 300 investors uh, looking at our uh, startup companies. Thanks also to the digitalization and, the, and the, the corona as well. Yes, advanced manufacturing and complex systems. That's the manufacturing uh, uh, industry and our 
Today, strongest research group and most promising is the DAMI 4.0 group, Digitalized Adaptive Manufacturing Industry 4.0, which Andreas is the, uh, the founder of and the leader of today. But I think you have uh, uh, taken away the 4.0 because now you can see 5.0 or even 6.0. <laughs> so DAMI is the name nowadays. And my um, understanding uh, of it is that you have all aspects of digitalization within the, the industry to, for implementation in the in the in the in the um, in the in the industry. But not only these technical technical aspects. You have also added uh, competencies about business development because you have you might have to to also in, uh, change the business models when you transform your company in a such uh, a, a revolutionary way, but also the softer side. So the uh, gender studies center at Castle University are also a part of this, of this uh, center for, for uh, digitalization and industry. So I think this, it, it's, it's a very beautiful example on how the researchers from different groups at the university can, can come together and, and build a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and see, if, well, uh, I, I, I can also add to this, that this also builds on an investment, a joint investment we did, Region Verbrand and Kosta University, 10 years ago, which started, there we jointly funded 10 new professorships. Uh, I think I will never do that again in my career. <laughs> that was a, a unique opportunity. Uh, and now it's, it shows that four of them are, were quite crucial to form this DAMI research group. So I made that conclusion and others has, has made it as well. So you, it's a very obvious sign that it pays off such kind of investments. And now we have a new agreement with uh, cost the university and I think I, I think I've finalized my presentation here so we have a new agreement with Costa University under the, the brand the, the Academy for smart specialization uh, our politicians has promised to support with uh, uh, at least 1 million euro per year to support research and innovation at Costa University and Costa University they, they also co-fund with at least as much and we also have a, an expectation that they should gather uh, external funding for also one million at least and what we can see happens even out of that is that the researchers also apply for funding for other sources so historically we have found that one euro from region Bernan it contributes to research for 10 euro at, at Costa University. So it it's pays back very much for, from our side to, to invest at Costa University. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Anders. I, it was for me a very great experience to learn from how Wormland and how work together, this bottom-up approach, this democracy approach and so on, and uh, how you communicate to each other. And so I thought it is important that we have this presentation here and therefore thank you so much and we can talk to him. You, you can talk to him during the lunch break now, half an hour about, and we are back uh, a quarter to uh, one. Okay, please.